Okay, so what I want to do now is I want to talk a little bit about how to do things in Mathematica. So, you know, this is a sample program I wrote. Uh, this is working for Mathematica version 6. I think this also works on version 7 without any trouble. Uh, one thing you can do is, you know, you can highlight text. You know, Alt 1 is largest, and you're just hitting different alts. You can change, you know, the size of the text just so it displays better. If you put stuff in quotes, it allows you to write comments, you know, compiles things a little bit better. If you want to compile a line in Mathematica, you have to use Shift Enter. I don't compile the instructions. Anything between a parenthesis star and a star parenthesis is just commented out. If you're writing code, I strongly urge you, if it's complicated, put comments. You may look at it five years later, and you may not remember. Use good descriptive names. I'll sometimes use things like you know, Bob, Lenny, and Carl just for fun, but try to have good names of your variables. So the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to compute 4 times 5. So we're going to do shift enter. Is everybody excited? And we get nothing. And the reason we get nothing is we have a semicolon at the end. What we've done is we've calculated 4 times 5 and we've stored it in the variable called num, but the semicolon suppresses the output. However, and I know everything's compiled so you can look ahead and you can see what 4 times 5 is, but now if you compile, you see, oh, number is just 20. If I had done it like this without the semicolon, it would just automatically come out as 20. Now, if you do 4 times 5 times 2, divided by 2 times 3, you get 30. Is this what you were expecting? So am I thinking of, I'm thinking of, you know, either please excuse my dear, or my dear, either Aunt Sarah or Aunt Sally, depending on who you were, you know, who your teacher was. The order of operations. Mathematica does the multiplications and divisions at the same level as it's passing it. So it'll do 4 times 5 divided by 2, and then it'll take that and multiply by 3. If you want the 2 times 3 to occur um, together, you need to put that in parentheses. And what you'll notice is Mathematica keeps things as exact as it can as long as it can. So it's not going to simplify this to 3.333, or whatever it's supposed to be. Uh, it will keep it as 10 thirds as long as possible. Okay, many standard functions are already pre-programmed in Mathematica. Cosine is capital COS, sine is capital SIN, it then wants the argument in brackets. Square root, you know, log, this is the base, this is the number. I always forget which way things go. And so if you're ever not sure, open up another window and just do another, you know, simple test and say, okay, is it log 10 over 100 or log of 100 based on you? Does the base come first or second? And so if I compile that, you know, it'll compute all these different things. I'll talk about this later, but if you forget a command, you can always just do, you know, question mark log and then compile, and it will tell you things about the log of it. So if you don't have two arguments, it will just do things automatically base e. If you have two arguments, uh, it does base followed by the number. It has the formula for the Fibonacci's pre-programmed into it. So you can calculate Oops, it's now 2011. Yeah, huge change. Uh, so you can calculate the Fibonacci numbers very quickly. You know, if people are interested, there's a simple formula to calculate the Fibonacci numbers. I'm happy to talk about that. I don't want to write out the word Fibonacci every single time. Um, and so here, I could create a shortcut command. And so this will be our very first function. And so the command I'm going to do is the, I'm going to try to calculate like the golden mean. So this is actually a very bad name. So I'll call it you know, GM for golden mean. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate Fibonacci and divide it by Fibonacci and minus 1. And so n is my variable, I have an underscore to mean this is the variable, and then colon equals is I'm defining it this way. And so I've now calculated, you know, Fibonacci to 2010, oops, I've changed the name of the command from Fib to GM, it's called GM. Okay, so this is the ratio of the 2010th of the, the 2009th Fibonacci number. Does this mean anything to you? No. So, what I want to do is I want a numeric result. There's two ways to do it. One is I could put n around this and just do it numerically. But then, that's annoying because every time I want to do this, I'd have to do that. Or I could put over here, multiply by 1.0. And as soon as you multiply by 1.0, Mathematica no longer tries to keep it exact. And so because of that, it will now round things a little bit. If you want to input a matrix, this is how you do a matrix. You start and end with curly braces, and then each row is a curly brace separated by commas. 
So this is the matrix 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 0, 8, 9. And as you might remember from one of our homework problems, uh, the reason I have to do this is if I put 7, 8, 9, it would have 0 determinant. If I want to multiply a matrix by itself, it's just m dot m, which is fairly easy. Now, unless you've really been you know, looking at Mathematica for a long time, this is not going to be easy for you to pass. As this does not really look like a matrix. There's a way to make it display a little bit better. Uh, so inverse m is going to give is going to be the inverse of the matrix M. And since I don't have a semicolon, it will display it. Uh, capital I for inverse, you know, square brackets, the, in, the input is a matrix M. And now matrix form is going to display things nicely. So this is going to print the inverse of the matrix twice. And the second time it just you know, prints it in a better way. Okay, so now I want to calculate the eigenvalues of the matrix. Uh, how many of you have heard of eigenvalues? So you'll do more with them in linear algebra. Uh, right now this should look like gobbledygook. The problem is there is a formula for the roots of a cubic equation. Mathematica sometimes is really annoying about uh, keeping things exact as long as possible. It's not numerically approximating the roots. And so if you want to you know, do this, you can, there's various tricks. You know, there's the n for numerics. If that's not enough digits for you for pi, just do you know, 20 to give 20 digits. And now I'm going to calculate the eigenvalues of my matrix M, and I'm going to do n for numerics. And so it gives you, you know, something plus you know, something i, so there's imaginary components here. If I want the first entry of this list now, it's just C1. Nope, C1 doesn't work. It's C double square brackets around 1. And so to me it's always annoying, you know, when do you need single brackets, when do you need double brackets? If you're ever not sure, open up another document, create a, you know, a list called Bob, you know, you know, curly brace 1, 2, 3, and just test how to call entries of Bob. Okay, so now if I want the entry of C, I can now take C, double brackets, 1. And so, you know, here's Bob, you know, here's a list of objects. And so what's nice about Bob is, you know, Bob has three elements. Oops. And so for the elements of Bob, one thing has three elements, the next has two, the next has two. And so if I want to take the first element of Bob, second entry, it's double brackets, 1, double brackets, 2. Or better yet, double brackets 1, 2. They'll both give me the same thing. You can make a table, you can make a matrix from a table, you can plot functions. So this is plotting the sine function uh, from 0 to 2 pi. If you want to plot multiple functions at the same time, you can do you know, curly brace and curly brace, and then just the multiple functions you want in here. And you can see the similarities between sine and cosine. If you want to plot something in several variables, you use plot 3D. Sadly, Mathematica can only plot up to three dimensions. And now what's really nice about this is, let's say you want to change your perspective. You can click on the box, you can make it bigger, you can click on the file, and you can spin it around and change your view to really get a sense of what the shape is. And so it's very nice to be able to do this and see. Uh, if you want to integrate a function, you can do your know, integrate. And so this will try to integrate the function t e to the negative t squared from 0 to x. There's a nice closed form solution. If I want a numerical solution, I use n integrate, and I get approximately 0.5. Alright, so, so here's some stuff for cross products. So let's let you know v be the vector 1, 2, 3. So th this is your curly brace 1, 2, 3, w is 1, 2, 3. This will calculate 3v plus 4w, v dot w, the cross product of v and w, the cross product of vw divided by the length of the cross product of V and W, and the cross product are divided by the norm. So here's my vector 3V plus 4W. You see how easy it is to calculate stuff like this. Here's V dot W. Here's V cross W. Here's V cross W divided by the length. Here's V cross W divided by the norm. So the problem is Mathematica uses length to calculate how many objects are in your list. The vector is a list with three elements. Both V and W have length 3. The norm of the vectors is different. So I could calculate, you know, uh, if I wanted to, the norm of V and the norm of W. And so the norm of V is the square root of 14, the norm of W is the square root of 77. So again, the stuff we're doing with vectors right now, you can check very easily in Mathematica. Okay. Any questions on what we've seen up till now? So now we're going to do a little bit on defining functions. So 
this is probably one of the stupidest things you could ever do. Mathematica has a built-in function for prime numbers called prime. I'm going to define a new function called nth prime, which has even more characters. You'd never do something like that. Just for illustrative purposes. And again, it's n underscore and you know, colon equals. So now, rather than typing you know, prime with a capital P, I can type this longer thing. And we can calculate the 10th prime, the 9th prime, you know, if you want, what's the 2011th prime? It's 17483. Okay, here's at least a better one. The difference between the nth and the n minus first prime. And so now I can calculate the difference between the 10th and the 9th prime. I now can define the power sum. This is going to sum the kth powers of i, i ranges from 0 to n. There's really no reason to have this start at 0, but why not? And so I can very quickly calculate the sum of the squares of the first you know, 100 numbers. So here's a more interesting example. So this is counting the number of solutions to the equation uh, x squared plus y squared equals a modulo n. How many of you have ever done modulo or clock arithmetic? Everybody's hand should be up. If it's 10 o'clock now, what time is it in five hours? 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock. So you're all telling me that 10 plus 5 is 3. In group theory, you'll do even more on this. It's an extremely useful concept. So 10 plus 5 is 3. Wonderful. So this is counting how many times um, x squared plus y squared equals a up to a multiple of n. And so what I'm doing is, you know, I'm going I'm to print out what we're going to do. I set my count to be 0. I clear my list of solutions. There's no need to do this. This is just good habits. I define my list to be empty. x is going to go from 0 to n minus 1 in increments of 1. So use comma, comma, plus, plus. This is how we do a for loop. This starts the for loop. For y goes from 0 to n minus 1, we'll increment y by 1. This starts the for loop for y. And then you're know, good commenting, you know, I'm a great programmer. I'm saying here, I'm ending the y for loop. I'm ending the x for loop. And then I'm going to say, if x squared plus y squared minus a modulo n equals 0, that's what this line does here, I'm going to print we found a solution, and I'm going to list the solution. I'm going to increase my count by 1, and I'm going to save the solution to my list of solutions. So, list of solutions appends to my list the new solution that I found. And I'm going to print the number of solutions, and I'm going to print the solutions are. And so now if I want to compile it, I just write num solutions, and now I'm going to take um, n to be 5 and a to be 1. And so it tells me if I want x squared plus y squared to be 1 mod 5, here are all the solutions. And there are a total of four solutions, and these are the four solutions. And so if I now want to you know, call things, you know, I can bring things up from list of solutions. So again, you know, nobody really cares about you know, this problem, but this shows you some of the stuff you can do. Uh, the next one is you know, stuff on doing histograms. Uh, the annoying thing here is things have changed a bit from earlier versions. Uh, probability distributions and plotting. You know, various things here. Um, here's a sample program for eigenvalues that some of my students work on. Uh, 3x plus 1 problem, which some of my students look at. Uh, the Josephus problem. How many of you know the Josephus problem? All right. Um, I have to be careful because this is being recorded. Uh, I'm not recommending we play this, but what you do is you take a gun with a bunch of bullets and you have people sitting in a circle. And the first person takes the gun and shoots the person next to them, who's now dead sorry. And I then pass the gun to the next survivor, who shoots the next person. We pass the gun to the next survivor, and we keep doing this until only one person is left standing. So the question is, you know, if you play this game with you know 25 people, or in this case, well, I won't say this case at all. If you play the game with 25 people, who's the one standing? Or more generally, what if instead of shooting every second person, you shoot every third person? Who's the one person standing? And so this is a short, simple program that says, you know, this is the number of people I have. This is every kth person is shot. And this will go through and calculate, you know, who wins. And so, you know, let's, anybody want, how many people should we play with? Ten. Ten. All right, and kill every how many? Three. Every third person is killed. All right, so the winning person four. So person four survives, everyone else dies. This really beautiful formulas to figure out who wins these problems. There's actually explicit formulas, especially in the case when you kill every person. It uses a lot of nice stuff on you know, difference equations, recurrence relations. One of my students gave a math colloquium talk on that last year. Uh, 
And we actually had the same number of people at the end of the talk as at the beginning. <laughs> uh, magic squares. How many of you have ever played with magic squares? So this is a simple program I wrote to calculate uh, three by three magic squares, you know, with various constraints. And so you know, it shouldn't take this long to calculate magic squares. Uh, well, maybe it does. Okay. So I may not have done the most efficient programming here. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at all possible permutations of the list of nine elements. And I'm plugging them all into the matrix and I'm just seeing which ones work. So nine factorial, that's somewhat large. You know, the computer should be able to handle this. This is bothering me. I'm impatient. I don't want to wait this long. Alt period aborts a calculation. Now this is actually very bad code. The reason this is bad code is I have no idea how much of the program I've done. Right? I might have been one second away from finishing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some new coding right now in real time. Um, count equals zero. And now what we're going to do is you know, we're going to do permutation and then count equals count plus one if mod uh, count divided by let's, let's start to count say floor of nine factorial divided by ten equals to do a comparison of this you need two equal signs equals zero print we are at and now what I'll do is I'll do 100 times count divided by 9 factorial. I'll do a floor of that. And then I'll do percent sign. And so the, I've ended the print statement, I've ended the if statement. And then I need a semicolon to end the line. So when you have a program, you have to do semicolon statements. So now, And now you see what happens when you try to program live. So the question is, is it taking us this long to get to even just 10%? Uh, yes, it is. And I was, if you saw, I don't know if you saw, I was just about to hit alt period and change this 10% um, to 100%. I'm sorry, to uh, 1% and print out every 1%. So this gives you some idea of how long the program is going to take to run. If you're writing programs that take a long time, you definitely want something like this. And we finally found a magic square. So we've now done 20%. And now we found two magic squares. So at 30%, we'll, by induction, find another one. Of course, you know, if you change a couple of these rows around, you know, there should be ways to change things so that you still get a magic square. Uh, this is how to save and read information. This is more advanced stuff if you want to have stuff for multiple things. Okay, manipulating plots. So what I will do is, you know, as beautiful as calculating magic squares are, is I'll stop the calculation. This is one of the great things that they have added in version 6. So what you have here is you have, I want to plot the function, the absolute value of x to the cth power times the sine of 1 over x, x goes from minus b to b. Well, if you want to plot something, you have to give it the numbers for b, and you have to give it the value for c. And so now, a normal plot command would just be this part here. This stuff over here tells me I want c to go from 1 to 2, I want b to go from negative 0.1 to 1. And so now what I can do here is I can change the value of c by just sliding this. And you can see how the picture changes. So here, I'm plotting the absolute value of x to the c power. You can see two straight lines. If I take c to be 2, what do you expect to see? Instead of straight lines, you would expect parabolas. As you're going all the way up to 2, that kind of looks, does that look like a parabola? Well, it's tough to see. Let's zoom in. So right now I'm going to zoom in on the b. And you know, as I zoom in a little bit on the b, maybe I'm zooming out. The other thing is you can, and that looks more like a parabola now as I zoom out of it. If I press this button over here, uh, it actually tells me what the value is. And I can override this, I can put in the value 6 if I want. It now shows me red because this is outside the range I said I wanted, but eh. The other thing you can do is you can have a movie. And so this is a movie of what happens as I change C. 
this movie might be going a little bit too fast, so let me slow it down a little bit so we can you know, truly appreciate the you know, beauty of this. So manipulate is a really nice feature. Um, you know, here's you know, a little bit more involved one. Okay. And so now what I can do is I'm going to choose the function. Anybody have any preferences? We'll do the quartic function. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move my point and it's showing you the tangent line to the curve as I move. And there's a nice you know, little feature to see what's going on. If I want to change my function, I have a drop-down menu here. Let's look at um, cosecant. That's a fun function. And you can see hey, things are happening and then things get back to normal. So manipulate is a really nice feature. Here's some commands to find minimums. Uh, if you want to solve differential equations, you know, later in life you will have this. Uh, you can solve differential equations, you can solve difference equations. Any Doctor Who fans here? Uh, there's a very scary episode of Doctor Who uh, called Blink a few years back. And basically, if two people were ever looking at each other, they both froze. And so you'll, yes, I'm a geek. This led me to think, well, okay, what's the probability if I have, you know, n people? and everybody randomly looks at somebody, what's the probability that you know, two people will be looking at each other? And so you, know, you can write you know, you know, simple code you know, to calculate stuff like this and you know, see what the probability is that you know, things like this happen. So this is a brief introduction to Mathematica. Any questions about stuff like this? Any things you wanted to learn how to do that we didn't do? Okay then, have a great rest of Winter Carnival. And I will see you...